not sure if I'm the last talk of the last workshop or the first one of the next workshop because I'm very late, obviously. And um, for several of you who heard uh, very similar talk at the fields, I just have a little update at the end to what you would have heard at fields a couple of months ago. And otherwise, uh, I was pleasantly surprised to see so many people still here after the workshop. I have very little to say, almost nothing to say really about non-smooth geometries, but I thought instead that I would speak about uh, the current topic because it began first in my very last visit, my only other visit to the Schrodinger Institute, uh, when Marcus Curry was standing up here and put an equation on the board and said these, this is a quasi-Einstein equation. If anyone knows about it, come talk to me afterward. And that started this. So this sort of brackets it. It also reflects on some work of uh, Piotrus. So I'd like to, uh, so I thought it was a suitable subject. So the very first slide is probably, no. Yeah, <laughs> okay, <laughs> always the case. Return. Oh, it worked? Oh, I see, let me try again, there we go. So the very first slide is I'm sure familiar to just about everyone here. This was prepared for perhaps people from the um, Lorentzian Lenspeyer metric measure community who don't know about horizons. So I want to tell you which kinds of horizons I will and will not talk about. Um, black holes, as I think you all know, have future event horizons. I will mention those briefly. They will come into play. Um, there are apparent horizons and various notions of that, such as uh, marginally outer trapped surfaces. Uh, those will again come into play, but not so much. They are a lower dimensional and more useful tool for things like numerical relativity than uh, event horizons. I will mostly talk about killing horizons. So these will be null hypersurfaces along which a, or there'll be hypersurfaces along which a killing field becomes null. They will actually be. Uh, be null hypersurfaces, and that killing field should be time-like just outside the hypersurface. Uh, there are also Cauchy horizons, which will not come into play very much. This is just a sort of semi-complete list for uh, non-experts and cosmological particle horizons, again, will not come into play. But um, the main interest here will be the topology of these horizons. So in particular with stationary black holes, so just to remind you of the terminology, I mean black holes that have a uh, killing field that is time-like near infinity. So they have isometries that move in space-time in time-like directions near infinity. But uh, that killing field might not be hypersurface orthogonal, it may rotate. So a stationary black hole would be a rotating black hole, but rotating at the same rate for all times, the curve black hole is an example. So in this case, several of these notions coincide. Uh, there will be a killing field which is time-like uh, near infinity. There will be the same killing field or another one which is time-like just outside the event horizon, and it will become uh, null on the event horizon. So the event horizon will coincide with the killing horizon and slices of it will actually be so-called apparent horizons, analogs of minimal surfaces in the Lorentzian community. So I will really be talking about killing horizons, but it happens to correspond to several of the other types in the setting that I want. I went the wrong way. And again, here we go. I see, I've been pushing, the, that's why it didn't work. I was pushing the wrong, uh, the wrong button. So a very brief review of what we know about horizons. Uh, first, there's the topological censorship theorem. It was not chronologically the first thing that we learned about the topology of horizons. But I cite two versions here, the original one by Friedman, Schleich, and Witt, that was in 1993, and one by Galloway, Schleich, Witt, and myself in 1999. The statement is here, the main point is that it concerns event horizons, and it basically says that the topology of the event horizon under certain circumstances cannot be more complicated than the topology at infinity. So if you think of uh, infinity as being the celestial sphere, then the topology at infinity is that of a sphere, and hence the horizons would have to be spherical. So this. 
Uh, if I can find it, I might be able to tell you. Uh, I, I think that's meant to be a script I, so I think that's probably meant to be infinity. So I guess that's a typo. Okay, so that's good. Um, so the corollary, which was due to Piotr Kruschel and Bob Wall in 1994, the original version of the topology is that the, the corollary is that you get the topology of the horizon from topological censorship. So really what topological censorship tells you is basically that every causal curve outside the black hole can be deformed smoothly to infinity. So if you have a more complex topology uh, for the black hole horizon, so say for example, you have a toroidal horizon, uh, if you, you know, just imagine a bagel, you will have a uh, causal curve which can go through the middle of that bagel without intersecting the bagel and then that's one that is entangled with the bagel. You cannot deform it to infinity. So you get this corollary. There's an asymptotically anti desitter version. That's the one that I mentioned in uh, the second citation here. So it works whether asymptotically flat or asymptotically anti desitter. Chronologically, oh, chronologically, the first one, the first such theorem of this nature was um, Hawking's theorem in 1972. And this really concerned apparent horizons rather than event horizons. There's a different energy condition assumption. I don't know if you noticed on the last slide, it was the null energy condition. This one's dominant energy. Uh, and basically this is a version of this kind of topological results that you get in the Riemannian world for um, uh, minimal surfaces. Not quite sure what I'd like to tell you about it, except that this theorem is really most effective when space-time is uh, four-dimensional. It has some use when space-time is five-dimensional, but it's not nearly as powerful. And beyond that, the theorem is true, but it really doesn't have, uh, doesn't have much power. Basically, the argument of the theorem, and it works by looking at the notion of stability of the apparent horizon, just like looking at stability of the minimal surface. Basically, it tells you that the Yamabe type of the horizon has to be positive. The um, original Hawking claim was that it had to be positive. That really was questionable until Greg Galloway closed it off in, uh, in 20. 18, it was clear that it had to be non-negative, but now it is clear the Yamabe type has to be positive. So again, in four space-time dimensions, a two-dimensional apparent horizon, that means just by Gauss-Binet that you're, you have a sphere. Three uh, horizon dim dimensions, three dimensions of cross-section, so five-dimensional space-time. You have a small list, you have spherical spaces, you have S2 cross S1 and connected sums of those. But uh, those are the only possibilities. But then in a higher dimension, uh, there's no, um, no statement that I'm aware of that is, uh, is very useful that comes from here, even though the theorem and its techniques work fine. Okay, so on to what I'd like to tell you today, something about degenerate killing horizons. All right. So at a certain point in time, I always forget what's on my slides, so I have to show them and then show them to myself before reading them to you, and you probably read them before I do because you're pointed the right direction, although I've got a copy down here. Um, all right, so the definition of a stationary space-time, which I think just about everyone here is familiar with, but again, to remind you, it includes the rotating case. If I'm not including the rotating case, I'll say static space-time. Sort of a time-like killing field, not necessarily hypersurface orthogonal. Uh, time-like near infinity, but not necessarily hypersurface orthogonal. Um, we will have a killing field, which may be that one that's time-like near infinity, or maybe another one, a linear combination of that one with a, uh, uh, with a different killing field, which will uh, be time like just outside the horizon and null on the horizon. It's um, a rigidity theorem of Hawking that this happens when you have so-called bifurcate or non-degenerate horizons. And that's the sort of thing you see on a Schwarzschild conformal diagram where you have a, uh, 
black hole and a white hole, and they intersect at a uh, at a horizon, at a um, sphere, <laughs> um, so-called bifurcate horizon. Uh, but I'm going to talk about the other kind, the so-called degenerate kind, and that's um, the last kind right here, also called zero temperature, and the corresponding black hole is usually called uh, extreme. So these are the kinds you get, for example, with uh, Reisner Nordstrom when the mass and the charge are equal. Then the conformal diagram doesn't have that bifurcate structure. The, um, I, I think I have a slide coming up that demonstrates it, so I think I'll, I'll wait for now. Um, they occur, you could think of it as taking, say for example, a non-degenerate Reisner Nordstrom with the bifurcate horizon, and taking the limit as you increase the charge without changing the mass until they become equal. Then inside you have a Cauchy, you have two horizons, a uh, double root of the lapse, Cauchy horizon in fact, and a, uh, um, an event horizon, and they coalesce in the limit. They come together, you get a double root, and that double root is what makes the so-called surface gravity, which I think is sitting here somewhere on the slide. Ah, right there, sort of. The temperature, another word for it really, makes that zero. Okay, so sure enough on my next slide, there's the Reisner Nordstrom family, but I think in this audience there's not much uh, uh, use in dwelling on it, I think you know. Um, there are a few others, I think, oh, there we go, uh, Reisner Nordstrom. The extreme curve, which is a nice case because it's vacuum, whereas Reisner Nordstrom is not. Uh, the Narii solution, and then in higher dimensions, the analog, in one more dimension, the analog of extreme curve, which is that you can have rotation in different planes if you have one more dimension. And these are the so-called Myers-Curie solutions. So finally, I have the picture that I Thomas, here we go. The difference between the so-called bifurcate horizon and the degenerate horizon, and here I've taken spatial slices. So the bifurcate horizon, um, say for Schwarzschild, you really have this uh, Misner something throat. <laughs> What's the word, Misner? Someone, you have the throat. I've forgotten what, uh, whose names go with it. Minimal surface, in other words and uh, two asymptotic regions. But in the degenerate horizon, you don't really, by taking a spatial slice, this throat just gets narrower and narrower, and the, uh, what would have been the bifurcate horizon actually gets uh, sent off to infinity, and you get this sort of point at infinity, which you'll see in the uh, um, uh, conformal diagram of Reisner Nordstrom. Then that'll have a future boundary, which is in space-time. Okay, so, summary so far. So I want to describe the equations that descend from the Einstein equation to govern degenerate Killing horizons. They have more general applicability than that, they're simply of mathematical interest, but uh, this is the way that we'll get them, is from the um, uh, general relativity application. Um, Stationary extreme black holes are examples, so a uh, curve that is rotating as fast as it can possibly rotate without becoming nakedly singular. If you spin curve right up to that extreme limit, then at any more, you'll, the uh, singularity will become visible. So if you're right on that limit, you've got uh, extreme curve. So you could think of this as a step toward the um, uh, black hole uniqueness theorems in complete generality, namely, um, you would have to classify the degenerate killing horizons in order to be able to classify the extreme black holes in arbitrary dimension with arbitrary cosmological constants, and so forth. So this is just a small step toward uh, black hole uniqueness theorems and non-uniqueness theorems in uh, completely general settings. So I have a little mention of that, but it's really going to display my own ignorance of the black hole uniqueness problem, so 
Uh, certainly what I would like to do is those in the audience who know more about it than me, I'm going to have some questions for you rather than the other way around. So um, perhaps this will prompt you. You'll be able to, to tell me what I've said wrong and what I haven't said at all but should say. Okay. So, um, so the question really is to find all solutions to the Einstein equation in vacuum or in cosmological vacuum, meaning cosmological constant but no other matter. Or if you like, with, Max, with Maxwell fields, so with very simple matter, with an event horizon and the suitable asymptotic region, asymptotically flat or asymptotically ABS, anti-disitter. Of course, compact spatial slices might be another potential option, but you'll have to make some sort of assumption of that nature. Um, yeah. When you talk about asymptotic ABS, right. Yeah, so I really want, I really want, uh, I really want full generality. So if by asymptotically locally ADS you mean the uh, higher genus, uh, for example, then I would want to include those. And in fact, a curiosity for me is that there's, uh, there are Kotler black holes, analogs of Schwarzschild in that setting, or analogs of ADS Schwarzschild in that setting, uh, which have, uh, if you try to take the extreme limit, the limit actually doesn't exist. There is no extreme analog. It becomes, uh, you get a singularity on the horizon. That's a puzzle to me, and it would be nice to be able to explain it somehow. So yeah, I want the full generality, but that, that puzzle will actually, um, one of my many motivations. Okay, uh, a sampling of known results, and here definitely I'm showing my ignorance because I don't have them all and don't know them all. Um, So the first uniqueness theorem ever, a uh, nod to my home institution, it was Werner Israel in 1967 who gave the, um, the Israel uniqueness theorem for Schwarzschild solution. And a beautiful um, reproof of that given by Bunting and Masuda Lalam about uh, 20 years after the fact. Um, Israel also proved the uh, uniqueness of Reisner Nordstrom amongst electrovacuum solutions, uh, Kotler solutions, the cosmo so I'm going to use lambda generally as a cosmological constant or Einstein constant, which may, maybe quasi Einstein constant would be a better word coming up. Uh, so there were results by, by Piotr Kruschkel with Anderson and uh, DeLay in 2002. Um, Kerr. Uh, that goes to David Robinson in 1975, if I've got things correct. Uh, degenerate horizons, which is going to be more of, uh, uh, of interest today. I've uh, got a couple of references here at the bottom. The unique uh, Reisner Nordstrom, um, Peter Hoesler, and uh, uh, results of stationary metrics due to uh, Piotr Kruschkel and uh, Dwen in 2010, have I got it right, Piotr? Yeah, more or less, <laughs> okay, not sure. So, uh, so but there are non-uniqueness results in the sense that if you look at the, uh, at the charges that you can measure at infinity in one higher dimension than we're used to dealing with, five dimensions, uh, there are both uh, myers curie rotating black holes and black ring metrics that have the same, uh, same conserved charges uh, at infinity. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so near horizon geometries. By the way, I will, I know that at least two of you have to leave at about 3.30. So I hope I'll be finished by then, I'll try to. And I think that's all I'm allowed anyway, is that right? I, it was scheduled for 45 minutes, so. Okay, so I'll try to fit everything in. Um, so now I wanna talk about near horizon geometries. Now these are, I'm only now in the setting or the context of extreme black holes, degenerate black holes, the ones with those uh, non-bifurcate horizons, the ones from the diagram earlier. So you can do a version of Gaussian normal coordinates 
on the killing horizon. And from here on, even though those different notions of horizon are equivalent in this setting, really it's the killing horizon notion that I'm gonna make use of. So basically you've got a null surface here and you're doing the same as if you had um, just the surface in a Riemannian geometry, you're building Gaussian normal coordinates off the null surface, but this is the form in which they would take. Now, if I can remember, the killing vector is d by dv, that's correct. It's time-like just outside the horizon, but no actually on the horizon. And little r is basically, if you go, uh, I've got a chalkboard, but never mind, I can do performance art. It's okay, I can do performance art. So here's your horizon. If you take null, past directed null geodesics from the horizon, they have an affine parameterization. That affine parameter is zero on the horizon, and then it is R from there on. So in other words, R is zero on the horizon, which tells you that the killing field becomes null at the horizon because you have an R there. Incidentally, that would be an ordinary, that would just be the first power if the black hole were not extreme. What makes it extreme is really that second power. If you're wondering why it's the second power, that's the condition for extremality. Um, D by DR is null everywhere and it's, uh, it intersects the horizon transversally and it's actually past director, I think the choice here, but it doesn't matter. Uh, then on cross sections of the horizons, what will happen, well, we'll get this vector field, which I call X, and most of the literature, it is, um, there's a little h, but little h gets used for other things, so we've rechristened it X, and then we have a cross-section here. So basically, now I'm going to take a limit uh, with this metric. I'm going to replace V by V by epsilon, so this is just a, really just a diffeomorphism, and I'm going to multiply R by epsilon, and then take the limit as epsilon get, goes to zero. What that does is, if this metric obeys the Einstein equation, so will the limit metric, it's just the diffeomorphism, but that'll kill R. So notice all the R dependence on all these functions drops out. And of course, it won't change this term here. So this is giving us a limiting metric. It has a different um, asymptotic region than the original metric, but it's got, it looks the same near the, near the horizon. And I've really zoomed in on the horizon by setting R to zero. I've stretched the V coordinate, but that really doesn't matter. I've just zoomed in on the horizon. Okay, so the so-called static case will be the case where X is uh, closed. I was about to say exact, but closed. Now, the sta static uh, extreme black holes will have X closed. That will follow from the static condition in the Einstein equations. But the converse not necessarily true. X can be closed for horizons that do not come from static, but merely come from stationary black holes. So this is a bit more general than the static case in general relativity, but I'll refer to it as the static case here. Okay, if X were exact, we could cheat a little bit because then we're really, we really have um, Riemannian geometry with a measure on it defined by the exponential of this function, which would be the potential for X. And then we could use results from that, um, uh, that field. And sometimes we will be able to, but I'm not going to make that assumption a priori. Okay. Um, so let's apply the vacuum Einstein equations, possibly with cosmological constant. Uh, yes, possibly with cosmological constant here to see what happens to that metric on the last slide. And basically it, it um, splits into these five equations. The cosmological term is sitting here. I think it's rescaled there by something like the dimension minus two or some trivial factor, but nonetheless, there's an Einstein constant now and it's sitting right there as well. Um, the Ricci, curvature, let's see, right here, the Ricci curvature of G is the Ricci curvature of just this metric here. So you can think of this as cross sections for which dV and dR are zero, so this is cross section of the horizon. No, it does not. I'm just coming to that. That two is this two, strangely enough. Um, so I'll motivate that two on probably the next slide. So this is the Bakri-Emery 
Ricci cancer, and it's the two of, uh, of that. The synthetic dimension. So uh, the last three equations here are actually redundant. You can derive them just from, uh, so you can take the third equation, let's see, if you solve the first two equations for x and g, then the third equation's the definition, and the fourth and fifth are automatically satisfied in virtue of the Bianchi identity. So we can throw out those bottom three and just worry about the top two. And I think that's what this thing says down on bottom. Okay, uh, no matter how fast I go, I'm, sure, I'm, I'm not sure I'll finish by 3.30, but I, I better, right? So I will. <laughs> All right, um, now. Ah, what do I want to tell you on this slide? Well, I certainly want to ask the question of when near horizon geometries are unique. This will give me at least some handle on black hole uniqueness in generality. Much of this work is due to Hari Kunduri, who is a collaborator on uh, what I want to say today, and James Lucetti. Um, I should have mentioned my collaborators at the start, Kunduri, uh, Eric Bio, and Sharmila Gunasekaran. Now, let's see. In dimension two, what is known, and in all dimensions what is known is if you have enough U1 symmetries, if in particular if you're, now the dimension here I mean the cross-section dimension to the right, and so n equal two, space time would be four dimensions. So in the n equal two case, one symmetry, in fact in n, in general n, n minus one U1 cross U1 symmetries then uh, originally the uniqueness here was due to Kunduri and Lucetti. In the higher dimensions, it's due to Collins and Ishibashi. Uh, also for manifolds that are uh, homogeneous manifolds, uh, in dimension three that was enumerated by Alice Lim, a student of Will Wiley's. Um, so there's some known results. I'm, Four, yeah, so it's going to be a cross section of the horizon. So, um, but in general, I want to ask the rigidity question. The rigidity question will be, when are the near horizon geometries, the solution of the equation before Einstein? Now, uh, I'm hoping that um, I did promise, oh, here it comes, the Bakui Emery, Ricci cancer. I knew that I promised to say something about it, okay. So I'd like to find all solutions of those first two equations. And without any cost at all, I can be more general and replace this one over two right here by simply a one over m, where m is any real number other than zero. I will keep it positive for now, but negative is of some limited interest as well. And this then is the, oh, I'm, now I definitely have a typo, that two should be an m. This is then the M Bakri Emery Ricci curvature. Some people use that terminology only when X is exact. I will use it in general, but I'm going to focus today on the situation where X is closed. So the rigidity question comes down to question of when X vanishes under these circumstances. Uh, outside of near horizon geometries, that's somewhat more difficult, but so near horizon geometries is my first answer. The M equal infinity case is the um, Ricci soliton equation. So that's well motivated. Uh, M equal one is one of the equations in the static Einstein uh, formulation, but I don't quite want to go into the static Einstein equation couple of reasons, namely there's an issue, there's an integration constant issue that comes up as well that you have to, um, that you have to consider. Um, yeah, I think those are sort of the main cases here. So let's, uh, um, well, the mathematicians look at everything including negative m, but they don't give a reason, <laughs> they just look at them. So finally, I'd like to classify the static ones, at least today, and that we'll be able to do in uh, two and three, we'll be able to say a lot about three, three n, n equal three for five dimensions. Okay, 
So uh, this uh, theorem was due to uh, Kirschkill, Harvey Real, and Paul Todd. And uh, I'm not sure if I have the dates right on, right on this, 2006, but I, I think I do. Um, basically, if the Einstein or quasi-Einstein constant in that equation a moment ago, if that's zero, and if you're on a closed manifold and X a closed one form on it, and by the way, I'll readily confuse the one form with the vector field corresponding to it. But if you're in that situation, then you get rigidity. Uh, Rick is zero. And I have a very nice proof, and I'd like to show you the proof. Um, if lambda's next to, if, if lambda's um, negative, there was a statement at the end of the paper that uh, you also get rigidity, you get negative Einstein, but the statement was provided without proof, and it turns out it needs a correction, and we'll have the correction today. Sadly, uh, my collaborator and uh, James Lucchetti, when they wrote the review article in 2014, they quoted it as a theorem, and it was simply a statement given without proof, and in fact, the proof didn't exist in the form that was originally envisaged, but we'll give the corrected form today. Um, so uh, what have I, uh, uh, what have I, I'm sure I've said something wrong here, but let's see. If uh, lambda is greater than zero and n equal two, then x is zero and positive Einstein. So uh, I got this the right way around. I'm not sure that I need, I'm not sure that I need that quote to Lucchetti, to Condori and Lucchetti. I think that's Pace and, uh, Wolfgang Wei and somebody else, but in any case. However, uh, statement two is, certainly needs correction, so let's go ahead and do that. Let's first look at the counterexample. So X BTZ is the um, BTZ uh, Bagnados Teitelboim Benelli three dimensional space time cross a two dimensional um, complex hyperbolic space time. So here's the BTZ right there, and that's got an extreme version. You can, you, there are two parameters, one which you can think of as a rotation parameter and the other you can think of as a mass parameter. And when they equal, that's the little a here, that constant, then you get this and you will actually get a degenerate horizon and you'll just get a, a Riemannian product with the compact hyperbolic sitting there. Okay, so if you compute uh, the near horizon geometry, so you throw away the V and the R, and so over here you will get uh, so this R will become zero. So this is just a constant, so you basically can absorb it. You get the phi squared and you get the compact hyperbolic. And so you can work out the, uh, you can just, uh, you know, the Ricci tensor, this obviously minus constant, minus constant, zero, minus K and minus K, let's say. Then uh, if you take your vector field to be this, and notice this looks like it's exact, but of course that's going to be misleading, then um, the problem you have, you put this metric on compact hyperbolic cross a circle. But of course the issue, as we know, is that if you try to cover that with one coordinate patch, it becomes multi-valued and coordinate patches don't become multi-valued. So you have to knit together two coordinate patches. So it's of course locally exact, but you have to knit together two patches. So uh, locally, yeah, exact, but it is globally not exact, merely closed. And if you work out, as I say, you get a zero eigenvalue for the Ricci tensor, but that's exactly the X cross X, the Bakri Emery X cross X, and that's a killing field, so the lead derivative term is zero. So in fact, you, that zero eigenvalue gets a minus two, and the other two eigenvalues were a minus two to start with. So lo and behold. Um, Lim gave a whole list of these things, and she wasn't actually aware of near horizon geometry. She was just doing a PhD thesis solving the Bakri Emery Ricci equation. So it was in her um, thesis a couple of years ago. Um, so, about the proof. So, I'd like to point out because I think it's a really nice proof, and also I'll point out the one place where you have to be careful and where you pick up the correction. And then Will Wiley has completed the argument now to tell you what you actually get. So, um, if I can remember how the proof goes. Basically, you write down, oh no, <laughs> okay, see if I can even get the right slide. Where are we? Here we are. 
I thought, yes. You write down this equation, the Bakri Emery Ricci Einstein equation, and simply apply the Bianchi identity to it. Nothing more than that. If you do that on a contractible neighborhood only, now in a contractible neighborhood, you can write your closed form as exact. Okay, so let's do that. And then on the contractible neighborhood, the Bianchi identity brings you down to this little equation right here. It's just an exercise. You differentiate, take a divergent uh, use Ricci identity, and voila, it pops out. So you can integrate that, just get rid of this, and you get that everything inside here has to be a constant. In other words, you get the equation that I'm pointing to now with the laser pointer. And that holds only on the contractible neighborhood, so on your little circle it would only hold, you know, three quarters of the way around the circle, but not all the way. Good. The left-hand side of this actually is globally defined. Because remember, we started by saying let x be locally exact, then you can replace uh, d f by x. So you get div x, you get mod x squared, and you get this just a constant, Bakker Emery m and the Einstein constant. The right-hand side is not globally defined. So on overlaps, you can set both left-hand sides equal, and therefore you can set both right-hand sides equal. So on an overlap, right here, I would prefer pointing this with my hand. Say on the overlap of i and j, the ci with an fi has to equal the cj with an fj. But the fj can differ from the fi by a constant. And that's the little cij right there, okay? Because you're on an overlap. So. What you can do, of course, is this has just the perfect form, and this is the key, that this form is that exponential. You can factor that constant out front and absorb it into the C. So then you will get a global definition. However, the main point, really, is that when you do this, all the signs of all the Cs on all the overlaps have to be the same. That's immediate from the fact that exponentials are positive. All zero, all positive, or all negative. If they are all positive or all negative, you can do this. But the problem comes about when they're all zero. So, uh, you know, I've got a little example here. Start with C1, you do the next, it, it iterates. But I think, I think the point is fairly clear. So um, let me go to the next slide where I um, make that point. So the, um, the problem is when the CIs are all zero. Now let me see what my own slide says, see if, I, see if it says anything that makes, uh, makes sense. All right, so if you could globally define one constant capital C by absorbing those little CIJs into the big Cs so that you get something globally defined, then you can integrate the equation from one slide ago. Maybe I better go back just for a second. You can integrate, uh, I guess it's the, I guess it's this one. Throw out the divergence and you get something with a definite sign here, depending on lambda, and something with a sign over there. So you integrate that and you will get this. You will get m lambda times the volume equals this uh, stuff here. So when lambda is positive, C can't be zero, and great, you can play the game before, uh, that we played before. When lambda is zero, same thing, c can't be zero unless x is zero. So if x is not zero, you play the game, but when lambda is negative, you can have c equals zero. And if c equals zero, the equation from one slide back is this. And there's no mechanism anymore for getting df, for getting the f in df to be globally defined, and that's why uh, that's why the limb counter example goes through, is it's, you're precisely in this case, you can check that you actually get this zero in her counter example. So you only get a partial rigidity, and in fact, here's the rigidity statement up here. You get that the two, you get that these two individual terms from one minute ago, the divergence and the magnitude of x, the divergence is either hiding here somewhere or it got dropped, but the divergence of x 
is zero, and the magnitude of x really does work out to be um, minus m lambda, so you only get this in the negative lambda case. But here's the full statement. So you get rigidity in the, uh, um, the other cases, but in the negative lambda case, you have this one little exception that limb goes right through. So Wiley has completed this argument, and not only do, you know, we were able to give these geometric conditions and so forth, but Wiley actually points out that the only thing that can happen is that in that case, you split off that circle and there's nothing else can happen. So in fact, you really do get rigidity. You either get negative Einstein or you get negative Einstein across the circle and there's just no other possibility. I got like three minutes. Um, I think I've got uh, Wiley's argument on the next slide and it's, it's quick. So it's especially quick because I won't go through all the details by any means. So uh, basically what he observes is he takes our geometrical conditions, which were this, and the divergence being zero, which he uses somewhere. So he just computes them here. If this, if mod x is constant, then you can check that these components of the Lie derivative are the gradient of mod x and therefore zero. And therefore you can take this combination and it works out to be zero as well. But then you can plug that back into the Bakri Emery Ricci thing with equation with uh, uh, and take the xx component. And the only thing that survives is the actual Ricci itself. You get Ricci xx equals zero. So, so the components of Ricci along the direction turns out to be a circle vanish. Okay. Then on the other hand, you know that, uh, uh, that uh, x is exact. So locally, if not globally, you can pull this trick again that we just used. You can write it locally on contractible neighborhoods as exact, and then apply the Bachner formula here. But that globalizes just like our formula before. We can replace all the grad, X, uh, grad Fs by X. You get this. And notice there's Rick XX, which is what we have up there. There's div X, which we know to be zero. And there's the Laplacian of the mod of x squared, and the mod of x squared is constant, so that's zero as well. Voila, you get Ricci xx is this, and yet we know that Ricci xx is zero, and therefore you get grad x is zero, x is parallel. Then from x being parallel, you get a local isometric splitting, and from the local isometric splitting, then there's a, uh, still takes paragraphs, there's a covering space argument that you have to go through to get a global splitting, the covering space, and then show that that global splitting descends back to the space that you are on in the first place. So there's still a little bit to go, but I won't go through it. Uh, and I won't go through any of this since I'm running out of time, but let me just pose at the very end a question. Uh, what about non-closed X? We were in vacuum with cosmological constant a moment ago, but when you try to think of actual extreme black holes, vacuum with a cosmological constant, well, you come up to that locally ID to sitter question that we had a moment ago, for example, but you can't really think of uh, many examples. So let's go to non-closed X, like, for example, the extreme Kerr. Here's the extreme Kerr near horizon geometry. This is the cross section. Notice it's pretty nice, actually. It's a warp product. Um, the two dimensional cross sections with four dimensional occur near horizon geometry. This is actually X for what it's worth, the uh, additional vector field in the Bakri Emery Ricci. And this turns out to be, it's not, of course, uh, this is a, a metric on a sphere. So two spheres, so the Ricci curvature can't vanish everywhere, but the bakri emery Ricci curvature can. It's a lambda equals zero quasi-Einstein metric on S2. Is it the only one? Now, you get this from the near-horizon geometry limit without really having to do any work except take the limit at the beginning of the talk. So we, uh, we know for M equal two that it's going to be, uh, that you get it. Can, is it the only one, in fact, for any n? Possible. And uh, you can also ask the same question for negative lambda. There's, in fact, of course, a positive lambda, uh, extreme de sitter, Kerr de sitter as well. But of course, with the positive lambda, you also have the, uh, just the round metric on the, uh, 
and the sphere, so there won't be uniqueness. Ricci is zero, that's right. So I think I want to end with, uh, with that question, and um, so I will. And a few people had to leave at 3.30, just left, so I know it's 3.30. <laughs> so I'm done.